quilts, I mean not quilts, blankets for our Linus project. And I know if y'all have any questions about it, we can talk back about it later. But what I'm doing is whenever someone brings a blanket, I embroider God loves me on it. And they, uh, I called the hospital and asked what the criteria was. And she said, in a perfect world, they would be washed and they would be folded and inserted in a plastic bag and the uh, it would be written on it you know if it's a boy or girl but i figure if she can't tell if they can't tell if this is a girl that's their problem so i didn't do that i did say that it has been washed and i put the dimensions this particular blanket is obviously for a little one it's 28 inches by 28 inches this one is 45 by 60 this one is 50 by 60 you know whatever I'm sure there's a child out there that's going to be happy with it whatever it is um, so if you have anything that you'd like to donate to for this I have I had um, a got a great opportunity to get some for very very cheap at the shrine after they had a uh, it's like a, a garage sale for children it's called we we exchange Anyway, I was able to get, I think it was um, uh, 12 or 13 of them for $21, so I, I'd help myself. Um, I got them half price too, so it, it, it worked out really well. One of them is even a quilt, hand quilted. Well, a machine, but still a little quilt. But anyway, but they're all different sizes, and that, so the size doesn't matter. Um, I had more... Um, more pink things than anything else because that's what was available so then I found out that Walmart had has these little <clears throat> these little blanket uh, blankets for 288 so I went out I went to the closest one and bought four of those uh, in boys so, uh, so it would help a little bit but anyway uh, I think the smaller the size the better and also we have some of those that the uh, that the church ladies were doing you know where they uh, slit the edges make the fringe and then put them together we think they're too thick for this purpose because if they're in the hospital they already have access to blankets it's yeah, not yeah. the warmth that they're looking for it's the cuddling so we're thinking about donating them to a homeless shelter or some organization that would benefit from the warmth of it. So um, keep that in mind. If you have any thoughts in it about that, we'll talk about that later when Johnette's around. But anyway, we, um, <clears throat> if, you have in, if you have thought about doing this, it's not too late. I already have, I think, 22 at the moment. Um, I think it's 22. But anyway, that's, that's a good number to start with. So... Just keep it in mind. Thank you. Next week's pantry, and this is the moment where Ann and I always get kind of nervous because we're wondering if we're going to have enough staff to help us put the pantry on. And as you know, we have 130 or so families that, that visit us every month, and we give away several thousand, seems like several million pounds of, of um of groceries and commodities we really need a lot of help um, we have a little a, a little alternative thing happening next week because my wife will be out of town yay and so if you could possibly be here a little early um, and if you and I don't see either of the two people that normally help her but um, we really always need runners we need folks that are that are willing to like lift the the boxes of groceries and help people get them into their cars and that kind of thing if if you can help us or if you're one of the regulars please be here if you possibly can um, some folks sometimes folks get here about 9 9 30 or so and that's fine but if you could get here a little earlier we usually sometimes the truck gets here about 8 so if you could be here at 8 ish that would be sweet that way we can help kind of organize things and any questions you have about it please talk to me after this and if you happen to see Angie Pruna come by, tell her to talk to me too. All right, thanks. Thank you, Roger. Just don't forget Food Pantry next week. Uh, call your attention to your program. Uh, just a couple of things real quickly. Uh, your important dates here, we're not going to enumerate all of those for you, uh, but do want to call your attention to the November 6th through the 8th is a women's retreat. It's going to be, of course, at Bluff Springs Campground. 
the theme for that weekend is uh, women rising up for God. And I've been told that the cost is $85 for the weekend. If you want to attend that, if you can't make it for the weekend, if you want to go down just for Saturday, they welcome you just for the Saturday uh, activities. And all it'll cost you is just whatever the charge per meal, ever how many meals that you will participate in that weekend. So uh, all you ladies, if you encourage you to take advantage of this, uh, go to the campgrounds and be part of that women's retreat. Also, for our priesthood, and I have sent out emails, I have announced this, I've had it on the program, and I know uh, this may not be the best time for everybody, but as many of our priesthood, it can be, we have a very important priesthood meeting today at 2.30, and hopefully that'll work out everybody, for good for everybody. We'll try not to keep you any longer than possible, but if you can be here at 2.30, please try to make it and be here to attend that priesthood meeting. Also, Al has on there that our seniors, we will be meeting this coming Friday, October the 16th at 10.30. It'll be in the latest part of our worship service. It will be uh, followed by a noon meal here in the Rock. So if you can possibly mark your calendars, do that and be here next Friday, 10.30. And just to call your attention to, I uh, haven't really shared this with you, it's on our quarterly schedule for our priesthood, but next Sunday is a really important day in the lives especially uh, Peggy Clemens and Josh Young. We will uh, share in the ordination of these two uh, women to their priesthood. I hope that each one of you will make a very special effort to be here and be part of that service next Sunday. So please mark your calendars again and be present and be part of that ordination service here next Sunday. We've already talked about this uh, bishop being here, Steve Jones, a presiding bishop on the 24th. A uh, stancil is going to be heading up that event. It'll be a question and answer period on that Saturday night. Uh, we believe uh, we are, we're going to start at 6 o'clock. So please, if you can possibly uh, be here, if you have any questions or concerns about world church finances or whatever, that young man will be here to answer them. So uh, be aware of that. Also, we want to, uh, Jackie, you have some friends here you want to share with us who they are and how they are and what they are? This right next to you, that's your family, part of your family? <laughs> Wake up, Jackie. course it and we welcome y'all we're so pleased to have you with us this morning um i said that because i was about to fix it. those of you who have looked at your program bulletin we might uh, be aware we put a note in there that uh, our prayers and concerns and thoughts are with the uh, elizabeth edwards family which part jackie's part of that it's mike edwards mother uh, who passed away this past wednesday and um they had the funeral friday friday and uh, so if this family sh uh, surely needs us to remember them. And if you've looked up front here, you might see a new face at our piano. And Austin uh, Sanders is going to share with us this morning by music and playing the piano for us. And we're very excited about that. And we hope that this will not be the only time, but the beginning of a lot, several times that we'll see Austin behind the piano keyboard there and ministering to us by music here. And just a real personal note real quick, uh, Marina Lefton is with the young people. If any of the young people are here, we are having youth church. Uh, no, if you want to be part of that, uh, the youth church is going on, but Marina's in there with that. But a couple of weeks ago, Marina's part of a soccer team that uh, is undefeated right now. And two weeks ago, much to our joy, she scored her first soccer goal. And so we was really excited about that. Uh, this is Marina's first year to be part of a soccer team, and uh, we think that that's really great. And so uh, I appreciate uh, her being doing that. Uh, I believe that's all that we have. I looked over our uh, directory. I did not see any birthdays. It's kind of an unusual thing. 
no birthdays that I saw or am aware of this morning unless someone knows someone that I'm not aware of. But is there any anniversaries or anything that anybody's celebrating? No one anniversaries either. Well, this is just one of those weeks then. I don't have that too often. We got some birthdays uh, for several of our members that are co it's coming up. So uh, let's be, we'll wait to that time. Gail. We do, we do. I am so, thank you so much, Gail. We do have a, a couple of visitors with us this morning. You see their names on the program. Uh, Kelsey and Jess, Jeff uh, Klein are going to share with us in uh, music this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we're so glad to have y'all. We so appreciate y'all being here. Sonia? And it's Jean's that's right. Jean, I figure she's probably going to share that with me during her presider moments here, so I'm going to let her do all that. Thank you so much for being here. Priesthood, don't forget, 2.30. had planned if you can't hear me raise your hand <laughs> I had planned to introduce Kelsey and Jeff Klein to you Kelsey is my brother's daughter and um, I wanted to show her off that was one of the reasons and the other was I think that she will bring us ministry because music uh, speaks to our soul. Thank you, David. Thank you. As I was saying, music speaks to our soul. It just gets you the right spirit for the Holy Spirit to enter in. We greet you this day in the name of Jesus. He is our Savior, our blessing. He brought us love when he came into the world. And because of that, we have salvation. 
and I think with salvation means we have freedom from sin because of his love. I'm going to read a combination of scriptures here this morning from the book of John and from the book of Mark. We come to worship because we need to be reminded of who we are and who we are becoming. We are children of God, a God who loves us and touches our lives to make truth and beauty out of our sins, to turn us toward the coming of the kingdom where there is love, for we are created in the image of God. God is love. All the things are possible to him that believeth. And I want to read that one more time. All the things are, are possible to him that believeth. May the Lord bless us and uh, lead us through our service. Almighty God, we have sung to you uh, an invocation which I'm certain each one of us in our here in our moments of concern and need have sung to you in one way or another, that you have been our hope and help in ages past and now our hope for today and years to come. And Lord, would you uh, come visit us this morning even in our worship that we can hear you and that we can uh, receive the affirmation once again of your desire to help and of your presence in our lives and of your presence in our corporate life here together. Pray in Jesus' name. This morning, I invite you to join me in a disciple's generous response, a responsive reading that is printed in your church bulletin, if you would please share with me. Faithful disciples respond to an increasing awareness of the abundant generosity of God. Lord, make us aware of your continuing generosity. 
share according to the desires of your heart, not by commandment or constraint. Lord, help us to open our hearts and share in our complete capacity. Break free of the shackles of conventional culture which promote self-serving interest. Lord, help us pull away from the trappings of our culture. Give generously according to your true capacity. Lord, help us to respond to the abundance that has been provided to us. Eternal joy and peace awaits you who grow in the grace of generosity that flows from compassionate hearts without thought of return. Lord, continue to break our hearts for those in need and allow us to give freely. It could be no other way in the domain of God who gives all for the sake of his creation. Lord, we are blessed continually by your generosity. Let our generosity bless others. With the deacons come forward. Let us pray. God, we come to you humbled by your grace and generous nature. We know we fall short of how you would have us live and share in your creation. Please, God, forgive us for the times when we have not given our very best to you. When our desire for earthly things began to take hold, remind us that all we have comes from you and you alone are our joy and salvation. Push us to be better stewards over what you have provided and extend our giving beyond what we might otherwise find sufficient. Give us grateful hearts to share with all of your creation. In the name of the one who brought us life and hope, amen. Let us pray. Lord, we come this morning to pray for peace of our world. The power to be gentle, the strength to be forgiving, and the patience to be understanding. For the endurance to accept the consequences of holding to what we believe is right. When we put our trust and the power of good to overcome evil, and the power of love to overcome hatred. We pray for the vision to see and the faith to believe in a world emancipated from violence, 
a new world where leaders shall no longer lead men to commit injustices of selfishness to bring suffering to others. Help us to devote our life, thought, and energy to the task of making peace. The one place on earth, Father, which you chose specifically for your dwelling is the city of Jerusalem, and you promised prosperity to those who pray for its peace. Father, we are always praying for the inspiration and the power to fulfill the destiny for which we and all men were created. We pray for the Middle East and the people who wish to be freed from the government of leaders who suppress their freedom, and we pray for Israel to remain at peace with their neighbors. We pray that our leaders will be instilled with desire to preserve this land for this I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus, while we get situated here. Good morning. Aren't you all thankful for Jesus this morning? Amen. I am so thankful that he died on the cross and rose for us so we could have abundant life now and forever in heaven. Because he made a way for us to have relationship with him and with the Holy Spirit and with our Father in heaven. And I want to remind you that God doesn't just want us, doesn't just want to be our Father when we get to heaven someday. He wants to be a good, loving Father to us right now. And he wants to have an intimate relationship with us right now. He's so good. And some of you may not have had a good relationship with your earthly father, and some of you may no longer have your earthly father with you. But you do have a father in heaven who cares deeply for you, who is for you, and who longs to graciously bless you. In Zephaniah 3, verse 17, it says that he exults over you with singing. What an image. And if we look at that verse in the Hebrew, we get a clearer picture of what God intended to say. And it gives us the image that God literally spins around with joy over you. And he sings and shouts over you with joy because of his great love for you. He created you and he loves you deeply and unconditionally. And as we play this song, I just encourage you to let God love on you. Because he longs to love on you and heal you where you hurt. And let's express our thanks to him and love on him back for who he is because he's done so much for us. He's given so much to us. And because he never leaves us or forsakes us. He is our faithful, perfect father. And this song is called Good, Good Father. of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and I'm never alone. You're a good, good father to you, heart. Who you are, who you are, and I'm loved by you 
to I am, to I am, to I am. And I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know that we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father to you are to you are to you are and i am loved by you to I am, to I am, to I am. perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us. You're a good, good father. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I am loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. You're a good, good father. To you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. In love so undeniable, I can hardly speak in peace. So unexplainable, I, I can hardly speak as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still as you call me. Deeper still into love, love as you call me. Deeper still as you call me, deeper still as you call me, deeper still into love, love. You're a good, good father, to you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To I am, to I am, to I am. Praise you, Lord. Good morning. How have we been blessed already? Don't you think we could almost go home? <laughs> Thank you so much for that and for each person's contribution and by your presence. I appreciate, I love you and I'm glad that you're here. We need each other always and just our presence is such a blessing. I greet you today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and ask you to join with me in prayer that everything we do today might help his spirit to be with us as we've come together. This is not just another day of the week. This is the Lord's day. And we have met together in community of unity 
and love. Don't you feel that already? We proclaim Jesus Christ and proclaim communities of joy, hope, love, and peace. And that's just not saying those words. We proclaim it in all that we do and say. This is not just a goal for us to reach, but it's a process of living. And it will be lived out wherever we are if we have the faith to move forward and to trust in God's promise that all things are possible through Him, how we need to remember it. This is a great challenge, and it starts with each one's lives who share any kind of community that we are a part of. A community starts with us and just one more person or many, many persons who have come together and this community is fashioned and is guided by our ideas, by our ideals, and by our working together. A community will have different ideas and different ways of doing things and this is a good and healthy thing, for we don't all have the same talents. We don't all have the same gifts to bring, and we don't all think just exactly alike. And it's a healthy thing and a good thing for a community to have these things, but come together with all these different ideas in love and in unity, because that's important. Each one of us must remember that each other and each one of you, not just me, is a child of God. We are a person of worth in his eyes and part of the whole plan has by God for our journey in this life is to take each other, love each other, accept each other, and let our lives be blended together. That makes community. The need for a community is deeply, deeply felt. And let me say this. I wonder how many of you read your Herald. Mine came Friday, and I read it. I sat on my back porch and read it from one end to the other. And you know, if I'd had that two weeks ago when I started working on this, I could just have read that to y'all today <laughs> because it summed up the ideas and the things that I'm trying to, that I try to make a part of my life. It was encouraging. If you haven't read it yet, read your Herald. It's full of wonderful testimonies. It gives, it's full of faith of people who move out. And I loved it. Read it this month. Read it this month. I want you to read it all the time. But, it, it, but read it this month. It's wonderful and you will be blessed if you, if you take time to read it. Now the communities of our lives vary with everything that we're a part of. Every community that we're a part of. They're different with our family unit wherever, whenever, and whatever that might be. And it continues in any group that we join in, that we are part of, who have interests the same as we do. Community is our workplace, where we see our brothers and sisters, for they are our brothers and sisters at work. It's in the community where we've met this morning to all worship together, where we have a common interest and are met together with one or more persons we are community. It's a, it's, and communities, in its truest sense, is the attempt to understand others and be understood by them. This is the very essence of Christianity, recognizing others as believers, as believers in and beloved of God and Christ is the truest form of acceptance that we can find. Being accepted, in turn, no matter what the difference is that our lives may bridge together, it's fundamental to what each of us is and what we may become. It's the very essence of joy, hope, peace, and love in a community. I want to read to you a scripture that we're all familiar with. It's, it's in, uh, I can see, you can get everything together, from the 10th chapter of Mark, and it's very it's just as true today as it was in those days. And it's the, uh, the, uh, the 17th through the 31st chapter. That, this is when the young, young man came to Jesus, and he asked him what could he do to be saved. And Jesus answered him this way. And, 
And when he, he, and when he was going forth in the way, and he's talking about Jesus, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked from him, Good master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good that except that one who is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against each other. Defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And you know, I think most all of us do that. I think we keep those commandments. The, the ones that's pointed in fact I know that we do these that are pointed out here. But the, and the man answered and said unto the master, All these things have I kept and observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. The man was sad at hearing this, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now we too keep the commandments. We don't steal and lie and cheat. None of us do that. But have we truly given our lives, our whole lives, to our Master? Do, have we become so uh, transformed into a likeness of Him that we see we need to do more? Jesus had compassion for this young man, and I'm sure that when the young man left and went his own way, that Jesus was grieved because he loved that person too. But this young man was lacking the very essence of the thing that he so desired. He wanted joy in his life. He wanted hope, hope for eternal salvation and hope to live every day. And he wanted peace in his heart. And he went away sadly because he was unable to accomplish that because he had not totally given himself to the Lord. It is and, and followed the Jesus as he knew that he should be doing. He was unwilling, as we are sometimes, to put Jesus first and his mission ahead of the desires to have wealth and probability position in his life. But he forgot the great commandment. Had he followed, and when he, if he ever became able to follow it, he would have had the very things in joy that he, in life that he so desired. Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now most of us, I don't know of any of us who have great wealth, but we do sometimes put our desires, our wants, and the things that's important to us become more important than following our Lord at times. We come to church. We enjoy, be, we enjoy being with one another. We keep the same commandments that the rich young ruler kept. But do we still lack something? Is there some part in our life that's not joyful? Do we still have things that we're hanging on to that don't bring us happiness? Do we lose hope when things are gone? Do we truly love as Jesus has commanded? Are we willing to put others ahead of ourselves? Until we do, we do not have the peace and the joy that our Heavenly Father has promised us. And where do these things fit into our life? Where does joy and hope and love and peace, how does that all fit into our own lives if we're going to claim, proclaim communities of such? We, let's talk about joy for a minute, a minute. We are all heirs of joy, for in John 15 we read, read this. These things have I spoken unto you, that joy might remain in you, and that your joy may be full. In case y'all are wondering, I'm having a little trouble seeing. <laughs> Before our relationships can truly become lastingly joyous and transforming, we must first be transformed ourselves. We must look deep within ourselves and see have we really transformed our life are we transformed people are we following jesus 100 percent 90 percent 
maybe on down to 10 and 20 percent. Only you and only I can answer that. And these things will only come into our life. We, don't, we have no way of having these things in our lives unless we truly learn to love one another as Christ has loved us. And at some point in everyone's life, everybody's, there's a deep yearning to be able to identify that source and to realize that there is one who knows us better than anyone else, including ourselves. We sense that joy comes through the very center of our living and our longing, even when we doubt because of the wounds and the hurts of living, feeling separate sometimes, feeling very wounded and alone and filled with physical pain. There is something within each of us that seeks the one who hears and recognizes us and indeed holds us closely and very dear, someone who holds us as, as his children. As the psalmist wrote, my soul longest, yea, even faintest for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. We all find ourselves there all the time. We should. Joy is possible to us when circumstances are painful and overwhelming. Joy is not just a transient feeling of happiness and oh, we're going to laugh a while. Joy is that deep, deep longing within each of us to be loved, to feel loved, and to know that we are loved. Christ is, and he cares for us. And this, I believe, is true joy. He is with us, within us, for us, and very, very aware of us. We're supposed to be proclaiming hope. Hope, what a joy, what a gift it is. What a gift it's given so graciously by the Master to those who claim it. We have to claim these gifts if we want to, to, to be lifted up by them and make a part of our life. Hope is a joy that can be given away and still retained. It can be given over and over and over again. It's something when you have the hope, you, are, you have it, you are blessed by it. When you are around people and share that hope that you have, others are blessed by it, just as our joy is. It's a gift that can bring to others all of our, all of our days, throughout all of our lives, that we can give it and give hope and have hope throughout the many communities and within the many communities that we find ourselves. It's a gift, infinitely effective, but may be as simple as a sweet smile or a hug or a pat on the shoulders, the gift of understanding and compassion. It doesn't always have to be something that's said. It can be acted out. When I think of hope and the people who've had hope, I, I, I always think about people when they were in slavery, when they were, were slaves to other people in the not too distant part of our past. They were such, most of them were such deeply religious people, and they still are to this day. And the one thing that I think, this is just my opinion, the one thing I think that kept them together and kept them ever pressing forward was a hope, the hope that things would be better, that things would be better than they were. Each of us have that hope. We want things to, we want the very best to be in the future. We want to hope for it and not lose sight of that. We value the past, but we can't become discouraged by changes that come about that are hard for us to understand. Change is always present. Change happens constantly, almost. And it calls us to look forward, as I said, to the things that are ahead. Now, our congregation is not as large as it used to be just a few years ago. But it's still alive, and it's still well. We are still here. We must have hope. The Lord tells us that Zionic conditions are no closer to us or any further away than the spiritual condition of my people. And we in this congregation are his people. And it's, we must be spiritually strong and ever have hope. Have we forgotten this? Where is our hope? 
sometimes we look around and we think all this all is gone where are we going i even hear some of us say sometimes but you won't hear me say this i'm guilty of many things but not of that the church is dying it isn't dying unless we want it to do we not believe that all things are possible with god we must be hopeful and prayerful and willing to follow him into new paths that come our way this day the task that others have followed the, the paths they have followed brought us where we are but we're on a new road this is the time we live this is the area of our life that we're responsible for this is the time that we can give hope and exercise hope and he will lead us into new paths he may lead us into strange paths that we've never heard of but by faith we will grow god is full of surprises he I think, you know when we close the bible and say this is all there is think of the surprises that have come about since this book was published think about the surprises that have come about in your life life is full of surprises good and bad in third nephi 29 we read this wherefore you must press forward with the steadfastness in christ having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of god and for all people let's not be dis uh, victims of of distress and fear and disappointment let's not be that, that because all things are possible with god and without knowledge and faith and knowing that he can do all things we might as well stop right where we are because we're not going to go any further we're not going to grow unless we have hope unless we have faith and unless we truly believe that in god all things are possible love is another element of this of this of this uh, phrase that we proclaim to the world that we're responsible for helping people to have love and then love is just a catch-all word sometimes for so many things we use it to describe all kinds of feelings. My, we love that dress. I just love that movie. I can hardly wait to get my hands on that book. You said you loved it, and I know I'm going to love it just more than that. Oh, I just love my little doggie and my cat. They're just so sweet. Those are kinds of love, but that's not the kind of love that Jesus was referring to when he told us to love God and others. What he meant was the deliberate choices we made to love others, to decide and to choose and make an effort to love, love others. We choose to love even the unlovable when we follow Christ. It's at the heart of being a Christian. Love is the most important thing that we can have. And this effort goes far beyond the merely self-serving but it is a priceless and a rare beauty, and it's worth following Jesus. Jesus spoke to Peter in no uncertain terms, as, as we all know this, and I want to read to you from John 21, the 21st chapter, a few verses from there. This is, now that the third, this is now the third time that Jesus showed him to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. So when they had died, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him again the second and the third time, Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him, after the third time asking him, Did he love him? Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said this unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he says unto the Lord, Thou knowest all these things that I love is love me. And Jesus said, If you love me, feed my sheep. What does that say to us today? Do we need to ask ourselves maybe this morning, Do I love Jesus? And answer truthfully. Perhaps we would say, Jesus, you know I love you. 
what he would say to us and he would say to me this morning and to each of you if you love me feed my sheep perhaps we too have to be reminded need to be reminded again and again of that same question do we love the Lord Robert Measley who was an apostle of us several years ago wrote in the Herald and I don't know which it's a back Herald public uh, I came across as many of you know I saved my Heralds and I found this and he so clearly and plainly stated this to say that God is love as in John 4 8 is to affirm that nothing is more deeply spiritual nothing more important nothing more at the heart of our existence than to love wherever this whenever this is forgotten the church and the gospel go astray we must remember the great commandment we must practice it Jesus's whole ministry was based on sacrificial love you think about it his many healings his teaching of justice in all forms his defense of the defenseless the upholding of those considered inferior his attending to the physical needs of all those that he came to, that he served, was done in kindness, and it was done in love. His openness to even those considered to be in his enemies, he showed great love. Now, one of Jesus' greatest acts during his ministry showed the depth, this one thing showed the depth of his real love that he had, not just for humankind, but for in general but for individuals for you and for me those chosen by him to follow him in his last few years jesus knowingly humbly and lovingly washed the feet of judas his betrayer this is love beyond the capacity that most of us have he looked beyond the act of the person understanding the temptations Judas had and saw him with compassion how quickly we are to judge one another attempting attempting to, to uh, just say that was the wrong thing but Jesus looked at, at, at him with compassion because he loved him we too must be honest Jesus was honest he confronted this one who was going to betray him and lovingly washed his feet and had his and served the wine and the bread to him. Jesus and Judas was aware, the scripture said, told us that Judas was aware that Jesus knew. And Jesus probably was suffering right along with Judas because he knew the guilt, the anguish, the and the torment that was already overtaking Judas at the time. I want to read to you from, from Nephi a wonderful statement that we have, and it comes from a book of Nephi, uh, from first, first Nephi, but no, I saw it from the, the 17 through 19. And it, and I'm so sorry. You know I'm about half blind, so I like you do anyway. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land because of the love of God, which dwelled in the hearts of his people. And there was no envy, no, there was no envy, no strife, no tumult, no whoredom, no lying, nor murders, or any kind of lasciviousness. And surely there could not have been a happier a happier people among all the people who had ever been created by the hand of God. Love is, is so much deeper than we take it to be so much of the time, but we all strive to do that. Perhaps the most demanding, perplexing, and challenging uh, thing that we have to do is to deliberately put peace in each other's hearts. And we have to do that in the ordinary days with ordinary people in our relationships, with those that we are closest to, whether we're not within our families or with friends and acquaintances. It sometimes is the hardest place to express in all our Christian activities in the right way. We explode 
uh, with anger at our children. And I'm not saying you, I'm saying we. We explode in anger when they don't, do, don't clean up their rooms, don't do the things that they, do, that they need to do. We lash out at our spouses sometimes just because we're angry. Who of us has not reacted in anger? And I almost didn't write this down because I'm so guilty of it. Who of us doesn't react angrily to someone who takes our space on the highway? What that turkey, what's he doing doing that? That's not showing us, not keeping and not exercising a loving and peaceful attribute. I put it in there because I find myself there sometimes, do you? Who of us not reached out at that turkey that did us so wrong? The ability to follow Christ in our relationships is very hard to do because we are so intimate and so close to each other. We need to pursue all through our lives, minute by minute, day by day, and year by year. And this is a great, it's a great goal to have. I will pursue peace and love. Can we succeed or not? Can we do that? Our Lord tells us that we can do all things through Christ. So I'm going to stop. I'm going to try my best the next time somebody pulls out in front of me to smile at them. I usually just get so angry. It's a, sometimes confessions are good for the soul. I'm not a good driver. I guess that's why, why it makes me so. I feel like everybody ought to go right along and drive just like they're supposed to. You won't endanger me or anybody else. But I'm going to work on that. Our challenge is to love endlessly, but we may do only what we have the ability to do. There's some things we can't do, and we know we can't do it. But we need to be involved in every effort that we can to bring love and peace to this world. We must always be there for others, whether they're in our family, whether they're in our, uh, in our community here, or whether they're in the whole world. We must do whatever we can do. And sometimes it's just that we, well, our offering can go for that. We need to be aware of all the needs that's in the world and make sacrificial offerings and, and, do, and be that kind of person. And we are truly following our Lord when we do that. This practice of loving has to be practiced all the live long time and it, and it has to be a determined thing that we're going to love those who are not so lovable that we're going to love and reach out in compassion to someone we don't particularly like it's such a hard thing and it's such a deep thing we're called to be a community of peace and to show the world peace how people are meant to live together in unity and peace how we as family country, nations, indeed the whole world, long and pray for peace. In Ephesians, we read this. This is in a letter that Paul wrote to, uh, I think I had lost my place. <laughs> Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, and it's, it's been many, well, you, you know, I'm not, I'm going to try to look it up. I can't, I, I have difficulty reading from this. The print is smaller, and I have difficulty seeing it. But it's in this letter that Paul admonishes, admonishes those in Ephesians uh, to, to, and to our community. It's the, it's the challenge to ever be aware of one another and to love each other and know what, to know, what, know what we are doing. It is a challenge to be one in the spirit. It is the assurance of the possibilities of being bound together in the bond of love. Are we bound together? This morning, as I look around our congregation, I do feel that we are. But when we leave here, we have other communities that we're a part of. We have neighborhoods where we live. We have schools where we work or our children attend. We have the friends of our children. They must be in this bond of love also. There are people walking the streets. There are people living in neighborhoods right near us that need this peace, that needs this in their lives, that they need to know they are worthy persons, that they are just as loved by God as you and me, and they must be reached out to. A few years ago, a lifelong goal, indeed a lifelong, uh, uh, a lifelong goal was to uh, build a church and dedicate, to, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read, I've lost my place. I'll just tell you. How many years as we as children were always, it was a, we had been commanded to build a temple, a temple to uh, pursue peace and to show the world that we were a peaceful people and to share it with them. 
I remember, and I, that's going way, way back. We had little temples about like this that we put nickels and dimes in. And then my children had those too. And we worked and we were, it was a lifelong goal of many, many people who lived way before we did, continued through our lives. And guess what? It was finally done. What an accomplishment. How good we felt about that. It's still there. It's still a beacon of hope. It's still a beacon of peace to all those who come. And how wonderful, what a wonderful gift this is to, to all of us. The dream of the, that temple started way in the past, and it's a challenge built this day and dedicated to the pursuit of peace. The dream, we, ha we have a new dream today to try to express our calling to a world that is bleeding and suffering, a different world from what we knew not too awful long ago, a world of, of uh, where everybody knew everybody and there was peace in our communities. But now we know because of the, of the communications that we have that we live in a world that's filled, that's bleeding for the love of God, a world that's suffering for the very things that, we, or that this peace, this temple of peace stands for and should always be a beacon of hope and joy and peace. And we need to find ways to express that hope and that joy. The lack of peace just causes all the, the lack of peace causes so much anguish. It causes wars, it causes deaths, it causes suffering, it causes poverty. You, I don't need to name it to you. How our world longs for peace. And peace has to start with each of us. If we're not peaceful within our own lives, not peaceful within our own selves, and know that we are worthy persons, children who are loved of God, how can we share that? We only share from our abundance, not for that that we have to keep to ourselves to keep us, us going. I think that one of the greatest sufferings that we do today is we, we suffer for a poverty of spirit. In our own church, we have, under, we have experienced division and misunderstanding. As we today sit here, quietly worshiping together, consider the need for peace in your own lives, peaceful relationships with others and with God, peace and relief from circumstances that rob us of peace, release us from fear, from depression or worthlessness, that's what we are to proclaim. God wants you and me and all people to turn to him and fill the empty places in our hearts and in our lives. Peace in its truest and simplest form is the knowledge of being loved by the creator, of being known and treasured and cherished. And we need to share this. It's our calling, it's our responsibility to do what we can to share this with every person we come in contact to with. We must be about our Father's business in every aspect of our life. If we're going to promote communities of joy, hope, love, and peace, we first of all must cultivate it within ourselves and those around us. We, as I said, we can only share from surplus because if we don't have surplus, we have nothing to share. God has given us a church and is in, an individual, as a church and individuals, so very, very much. He's entrusted us with such knowledge, with such care, with such a gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we must be about our Father's business, building communities, wherever we find ourselves. First of all, we can start at home. We go into our church, our neighborhoods, and all the places I've mentioned. We must be a beacon of hope, a light of love, and an expression of joy, and a way of peace by experiencing it within our own lives and willingly sharing it in whatever ways we find to share it with others. I want to close by reading uh, by, by reading from Philippians 4. I, I have typed it out here, believe it or not. And the peace of God, 
life which surpasses all understanding shall, kept, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. May, you, may we all leave this place. I have felt your spirit. I felt your tenderness, and I have felt your love as, I've stood, as I have stood here. I have felt the presence of our Holy, of our Father, looking into your faces. I experienced some of my greatest joy by associating with you, by having the kindred spirit that we have. We are a community made up of people who are loved by our Heavenly Father. We're not just a speck out in space somewhere. We are loved by our Father, and we must be about his business. We must remember that all things, whatever we attempt to do, can be done if we have faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. There is the wonder of sunset at evening, the wonder of sunrises I see, but the wonder that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. May you go in his love this week. Thank you.